Throughout my day, and perhaps you have similar experiences, throughout my day, there are reminders of things that I was taught as a kid. Perhaps it was stuff my dad said, perhaps it was stuff my mom said, perhaps it was stuff that our family said. And one of the things that perhaps you remember growing up is that people often said it's not polite to talk about politics and religion in polite society. Yet, here we come, after months and months of studying Romans, we see that yes, The word of God, because it's timeless, it's always timely. And as a response to the gospel, as a response to what Christ has done for us on the cross, we now see how we are supposed to understand not only ourselves, not only the church, not only our loved ones, but yes, even government itself. Now we've come to a day and age where Perhaps we used to say it's not polite to talk about politics. Has that day changed? Oh my, absolutely. Isn't it fascinating that there are probably about 12 different TV stations that you can watch throughout your day that focus just on politics? Some of us, we have apps on our phones that focus on politics. Some of us, we go to certain blogs and we love to talk about it with our friends. Are any of these things bad things? No, of course not. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to ask you to think of relation to government as it connects to the gospel and how we are supposed to respond in worship. In worship. Remember? Remember this whole thesis, this turning point as far as how we respond to the gospel was outlined in Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is really the foundation for how we now continue to worship God. It said this in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern, discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. We are called to be living sacrifices. And the challenge is, is that in this day and age, where it does seem like it's so hard to figure out the right path to walk, the right person or party to support, the right beliefs that are going to shape our family and shape our society, in the end, believe it or not, it has everything to do with worship. It has everything to do with the overflow of what matters most to us. What do we attribute worth to? Now, in our day and age, we have become not just passionate about politics, but obsessed about politics because I would submit to you that we forgot to keep government in its proper position, in its proper place. Was this a temptation for the church then as much as it is now? Absolutely. Every single generation needs to come back to God's word and remember and have their minds renewed that this is God's outline for government. So let's look, shall we? Let's look. Romans 13, hopefully your Bible is still open. Romans 13, verse 1. We hear some pretty strong words. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. This is fascinating now. Not only were you a little nervous about this sermon because it's talking about government, but now it's mentioning submission and authority. I know as a pastor, when we teach on grace and mercy and forgiveness, this room just fills with excitement and and thanks and gratitude. It's a little bit different when we talk about authority and submission, right? It's not something that we easily do. Now, when we come to this passage in Romans 13, we are going to try and understand this as it relates to the whole counsel of God. God didn't just give us seven verses. He gave us a whole Bible. Why is it that we're so passionate about politics? Why is it that we are so passionate about our land? Well, We have a dual citizenship. We have a dual citizenship. The passport was given to us through Christ. 
We have a passport to be in the presence of God in eternity, and that passport was given not because of anything I have done, but because of it entirely what Jesus has done on the cross. We can be part of his kingdom, yet at the same time, we have a dual citizenship in this life where we are citizens of his kingdom and also citizens of this great land. So how do we operate? How do we bring these two truths together? In this passage, we are reminded that there's no authority on earth. This is tough now. That it hasn't been instituted by God. Now, some of us, when, when our candidate is in office or our party's in power or there's people we like in charge, we like this passage, right? We tell our kids, we tell our neighbor, hey, listen, you got you to submit. That's what the Bible says. Until, oh boy, until somebody that we don't like is in office or somebody we don't like is in power. And then all of a sudden, this is tough. This is tough for every single generation of Christians. Yet the truth is unwavering. The truth is clear that there is one ultimate authority above any supreme court. God is even more supreme. Above any man-made law, God's law reigns. And transformation and true societal change happens in the hearts of people. We want to be salt and light in every sphere of society, right? We want to be salt and light, hands and feet of Jesus in our schools, in our workplaces, in business, in agriculture, all over. And yes, especially in government, we want to be Jesus. We want to spread the light of Jesus, okay? But as we see here, that this is a clear teaching that every single government, regardless of philosophy, by the way, okay? So some people are in power currently because of a dynasty. Some people were born into it. Some people are in power now because of the military, because of some military coup, and now they are in power. Some people are in power because of some kind of Plutarchy or some kind of democracy. Whatever the philosophy is, here's what's amazing about God's word. God's still in control. He's still in charge. Now, as you read the Old Testament, there's a lot about kings and kingdoms. As you read the Old Testament, you would see that sometimes kings are given to a people that don't deserve it. And a lot of times, kings are given as a judgment against the people because they do deserve it. Sometimes we're given the kings we deserve. Other times, we are given the kings that God uses to do really remarkable things. In the end, though, as we move from Old Testament to New Testament, this is a distinctive that King Jesus has come, that the King of Kings has arrived, that at his birth, at the first Christmas, there were magi that were coronating him as the child king. So here's the truth. Regardless of who's in office, who's on a throne, regardless of what generation, what church, what country, what demographic, Jesus is king. He's king. So now that Jesus has come in the New Testament, he's fulfilled all the covenants. He's fulfilled the law. He is the fulfillment of even the Davidic covenant. Now his kingdom is for all nations. His kingdom is for all tribes. His kingdom is for all tongues, all peoples. So how do we understand his authority as king and then still try to be his ambassadors, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, here in this land, in this kingdom. Let's look at verse 2. Therefore, building upon this, therefore who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Okay, so we could, we could approach this in a very simple way to say, as it's going to talk about in a moment, it is a good thing to pay your taxes. Because if you're not paying your taxes, believe it or not, you're going to be living in fear and anxiety that one day the hammer is going to come down. You're going to get busted. If you do the right thing, you won't be in fear of 
any kind of wrath or judgment or justice from the government. But we've got to parse this out a little bit, okay? Everybody ready? How many of the New Testament letters were written from the dungeon of a prison cell? Some of the letters Paul wrote, okay? The book of Revelation itself, written from the prison island of Patmos. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said there is no greater person who's ever been born of woman. That means no greater person ever born, period, than John the Baptist. And where did John the Baptist die? In a prison. So Jesus said the greatest person to ever live was a Baptist preacher. He said, I'm just kidding, that's just a joke. It's a little self-serving, make you giggle a little bit. What do we do with the fact that after John the Baptist was preaching the truth to Herod the Tetrarch, saying you are being unfaithful to your wife, you are in adultery, and because he was speaking the truth to power, it led to him not only being incarcerated, but then decapitated. Was he resisting the government? Was he defying what not only Paul says now in Romans 13, but also what Peter says in 1 Peter 2? So we understand it this way. We understand it that we are going to trust that God's in control, okay? Okay? But at the same time, that there is a higher law than human law, and we are called to be a prophetic voice in this culture and any other culture. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, all right, I'm new to the Bible. What does prophetic voice mean? Um, It doesn't mean singing voice, I hope. No, it means that you are giving a voice to God's word. You see, prophecy isn't just foretelling, right? It's not just seeing the future. It's forthtelling. You are proclaiming what is true about God. So the prophets would often do this. Jeremiah himself, thrown into a cistern. You remember Daniel, thrown into the lion's den. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. You see, in the Old Testament, we also see a guide of what we're supposed to do. Daniel reminds us in Daniel 4.17, everyone listen. The Most High rules the kingdom of a man and gives it to whom he will. So if we are in a government where we think things are going wrong and things are going bad, what do we do? Two things, ready? If you're taking notes. We speak prophetically and we pray passionately. We're called, as 1 Timothy 2 says, to pray for those in power, Pray for those that are in authority over us. So we still speak the truth and we're praying that the Lord would grip their heart and help them see that there's an authority above their authority. And if they understand that, then it's good for society as a whole. You understand what the Bible's trying to do here in Romans 13 is set a restraint against evil. There's only one thing that can truly beat back the darkness that is evil, and evil is real. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the cross of Christ. That's the resurrection of Christ. But God has given us societal restraints. So there is a certain function and purpose of the law where the law can restrain evil. I'm talking about biblical law now. Also, family. Family can restrain evil. The church can restrain evil, be kind of a boundary, kind of a landmark against evil. Now, we shouldn't be surprised if our culture says, all right, we're not going to submit to God's law. We're going to throw that off. We're not going to submit to the authority of our parents. We're going to get rid of that. We're not going to submit to the authority of the church given by Christ through his word. We're going to get rid of that. Then we shouldn't be surprised when people have a hard time respecting authority in government. You see how all this is happening? It's Romans 1, where we deny God his glory, and he hands us over to our idols, meaning we worship created things above the creator, and he hands us over to our depraved mind, an awful, horrible way of thinking, of living. So this is why in our day and age, have you noticed that everything's become politicized? I mean everything. We can't even watch a football game anymore without it being politicized right? 
Nature's politicized. Sports are politicized. Education's politicized. Even kids' bathrooms in schools have been politicized. Race is politicized. And then tragically, even the safety and the beauty of a child in his or her mother's womb has been politicized. Why? Well, that's because we're throwing off. We're throwing off any kind of authority. So we now are looking for two things. We're looking for power and we're looking for a savior. And if we throw off God as authority, if we throw off God's power and God as savior, what is so ready to fill that vacuum? Government. And that's why we have a love-hate relationship with it. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed? Now listen, you might love your candidate and that's a good thing. I encourage that. Be active. Please vote in a couple weeks, right? You might love your candidate. You might love the person in power right now. You might love the person that was in power that's going to be in power. But have you ever noticed that there's no perfect leader? Like there's no perfect king. There's no perfect kingdom, yet we all desire it, right? Where does that come from? We all long for King Jesus, And anyone that serves in the public sphere, let him be someone that gives glory to him. Someone that at least will try to practice and treat people in the same way, right? We all desire the perfect king. We all desire the perfect kingdom. Now, in a democracy, man, there's always somebody new that's coming along making a lot of promises, right? You hearing a lot of promises right now? And what happens all the time is that we hear these promises and we are so frustrated because, man, they hardly ever deliver. I will promise you this, okay? There are some good people serving in this area, but there's only one that will deliver on every single promise he makes. We need to have our expectations in the right place. So let's return back to God's word as we are reminded that God can use the government as a restraint against evil. And then he says here in verse 5, Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Interesting. For because of this, you also pay taxes. We love talking about taxes, right? Jersey. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Okay. Taxes are tough. Property tax is tough in Jersey? Yes. We'll just leave it like that. Here's the point, though. When someone approached Jesus in Matthew 22, they were trying to pit Jesus one side or the other, get him in trouble either with the Jews or get him in trouble with Rome. And when he was asked with the question, who should we pay taxes to? He said this beautiful, beautiful gospel truth. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and God's what is God's. Meaning that his face is on that coin, give it to him. You have the image of God on you. You belong to him. Give him the glory with your life. Now, does this mean that laws can and maybe should change? Absolutely. But when we are in this season, there is a higher good than taxes, okay? When we are in this broken and fallen world, there is a higher good than the legislation we want passed, okay? We can work towards a more perfect society, but here's the truth. What's the greater good? The greater good is the gospel, The greater good is the advancement of the gospel. It's the advancement of God's truth. And that's like that's why I like how Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2. Listen to these words. Now we have Paul and Peter coming together to articulate this difficult, sometimes confusing, yet at the same time, very clear truth. Verse 13: be subject to for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by them to punish those who do evil or to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, listen, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, Peter says. 
Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Who was the emperor at the time Paul was writing to this church in Rome? Do you know your history? Nero. You know anything about Nero? Nero was a special kind of crazy. You look up crazy in the dictionary, he might be on that list. Nero was one of, if not the greatest persecutor of the church, the early church, in all recorded history. He would drag Christian families into the Colosseum so they would be tore apart by lions. He would have them dipped in vats of boiling oil. He would have them burned alive. He, in fact, is the one who famously burned the city of Rome and then blamed the Christian population. Paul is saying to honor that guy? What? So you see, what is the path? What is the model? It's this. We honor God for his sake first. Peter said, for the Lord's sake. And then for the sake of the gospel, so we can live as free people, then yes, in the ways that it honors God, we will honor the king. In the ways that it does not, we have a higher citizenship. You understand how that works? I know it's hard to understand. Let me read now from the book of Acts. We're almost done. Everybody's doing great. Acts chapter 5, if you want to turn with me. This is Peter, now before the Sanhedrin. And he gives this fantastic teaching, this fantastic principle. He says here in chapter 5, verse 27, And when they had brought them, that means the Sanhedrin, um, the, the Jewish authorities, when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us? But Peter and the apostle answers. This is an important truth. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. There will come a point in a time where we have to choose. Where we have to choose. Do we obey the laws of man while we are still living honorably and paying our taxes? But when that rubber really meets the road, we are called to give God and God the glory alone. I'm going to be reading to close this uh, little excerpt from this book called Hitler's Cross. It's written by a man named Erwin Lutzer. And uh, if you have began to wrap your mind around the, the implications of Romans 13, you began to think, all right, well, what does this mean? I've often wondered, where was the church during Nazi Germany? During the genocide? During the fascism? Where was their witness? Where was the salt and light? So Erwin Lutzer answers that question, and it's not a question that uh, is answered in a way that's very encouraging. There were people, there were some heroes like Dietrich Bonhoeffer that stood up and spoke truth and once again died in a prison cell. But tragically, most of the church in Germany had fallen into this trap. Listen to this excerpt and then we'll close in prayer. On August 30th, 1933, Pastor Julius Luthserer gushed, Christ has come to us through Hitler. Through his honesty, his faith, his idealism, the Redeemer, Hitler, has found us. We know today that the Savior has come. We have only one task. Be German and not Christian. We hope and pray that as you try to ask the Lord for wisdom and as you, as a good citizen of this great land, continue to serve and vote and speak up, guard your heart, we pray. Deception never announces itself as deception. Power can be very enticing. Let the Church of Christ, here in Colts Neck, here in New Jersey, and here across the United States of America, never waver in its testimony that there's one king. His name is Jesus. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the name above all names. Let's pray.